Pastor Mike Harker coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're going to go back and we're going to revisit something that it's a phrase that I coined. Um, I won't say that God gave it to me or anything like that. I think it just sounded right. Uh, something that I called the King James Code. Now, let me explain that. Let me explain a little bit about how I got it, uh, what led up to it, um, and the study of numbers in the Bible and what differentiates our reasonable study of the numbers that are used in the Bible uh, versus uh, occult divination or occult numerology. And we'll get into that, and we'll talk about the difference here in a little bit. But basically, this all started, uh, it, I've told my testimony, but it's been a while. So in 1996, uh, I became the pastor at Bethel Church. This is my home church. I grew up there. Uh, I've buried a lot of the people that I grew up under at that church. I've been there uh, for most of my life. It's home. I, don't, I, I met my wife there. That's, that's worth something there. And, um, but anyway, in 1996, in November of 96, I became pastor. Now I'm bringing this November thing up. November is the 11th month. We, we date things that way. We say it's, a, it's you know, 10, 15, which is October 15th, or November, November 22nd, 11, 22. And, I'll go ahead and throw this at you. The meaning of the number 11 is chaos, confusion, disorder. What's in Genesis 11? The Tower of Babel. What happened November 22nd, 1963? Chaos, confusion, the assassination of a sitting president. Okay? Uh, I believe a ritualistic Hiram Abiff style killing. That's another video. But anyway... Um, so I became pastor in 90, in uh, November of 96, a lot of chaos in my life, in my ministry, at, in the church, I and mean, it, was, it was pretty rough. Uh, but God, God came in, God worked on me, kind of straightened me out a little bit, He's, you know, just start doing right, Mike. And I said, yeah, okay, Lord, I'll do it. And so then in um, November of 1997, a year later, it's like the Lord said to me, Mike, you're going to study prophecy. And I went, yes, all right. I love prophecy. I you know, just loved studying prophecy, uh, you know, all my life. I can remember reading books when I was just a young, young whippersnapper. But anyway... Um, there it was in November of 97 and here God is asking me to study prophecy and I'm boy I'm going to go I'm going to go buy some new books that are out from the from the Christian bookstore that are out and they're talking about prophecy and God said no I wrote a book and believe it or not you know I grew up in church grew up in that church uh, under some good King James pastors three years in Bible college, but it's like one day in November 1997, I had this epiphany, I had this revelation that the Bible is a book of prophecy, that everything in the Bible is a book of prophecy. It's telling us what's going to happen in the last days and with amazing precision. But anyway, so I, I immediately accepted that. So I didn't go and buy all those books that I could have bought. And, and I had a bad habit in those days. I would buy a book on like a prophecy or something like that, and I would read everything that the author said. And when he get to the scripture, I'd say, ah, I know the scripture. I want to see what he's got to say. That is a terrible habit. You know, I'm, I'm supposed to be a minister, a theologian. And, um, but then God turned me around. And so... All of a sudden now, you know, I would get a book. So people would send me something in the mail, and I would look at it. And before I read anything in that book, I wanted to see the scriptures, what they were talking about by way of the word of God. 
I remember I got uh, a book on prayer and uh, written by John R. Rice. And it was at a time I needed to learn about prayer. And uh, I, that God had instilled in me when I opened this book up for the very first time and looked at it, I was looking for the scriptures. First of all, I was looking for King James scriptures, and it was, I would say, 99% all King James. But anyway, I was looking at the Bible verses, and if Mr. Rice or Reverend Rice or whoever he was, if he had something else to add to that, I would be interested in hearing what he's got to say about it, but I, I want to hear the scriptures now. God's turned me around in that. And so anyway, I began to just read. God said, just read, read the book, Mike. And I began to read. I began to look at not just Daniel and Revelation, which, by the way, bear the same number. Daniel is the 27th book of the Old Testament. Revelation is the 27th book of the New Testament. Of course, there's only 27 books in the New Testament. Revelation is the last one of them. But they both bear that number. Daniel and Revelation are linked together. It's like, it's like God put them there on purpose. Now, you can, what I just said to you was a fact. Daniel is the 27th book of the King James Bible, of the NIV Bible, of the uh, New American Standard Bible, of every English Bible that we know of. Daniel is the 27th book. That is a fact. And what I want to do in this series is I'm going to give you numerical facts. You can do whatever you want to do with those facts. You can ignore them. You can, um, you can say, well, I don't like your conclusions and things. You can say all that. But what you can't say is that, oh, he's making that number stuff up. Do the study yourself. In fact, we'll give you the software for free. PureBibleSearch.com.org. I can't remember, but Pure Bible Search. Download it. It's free. We, we don't get any money from it. Don't want it. We're distributing Bibles in third world countries behind iron curtains, okay? And, it's, and people are being blessed because they're able to search the scriptures like the Bereans did. So anyway, um, I didn't just read Daniel and Revelation. I read Genesis. I read First and Second Chronicles and Kings and Psalms and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I read all of these, and I was just reading and studying. And all of a sudden now, I started seeing... The Old Testament foreshadowed things that are in the New Testament. I would see doctrines that were uh, pictorialized, I guess if that's a word. They were, they were like displayed out in the Old Testament. I'll give you a, a very easy example. Here we have, we know from the book of Revelation, we know there's going to be a beast and Revelation 13 says that he's like a lion and a leopard and a bear, and the dragon gives him his power, his seed, his great authority. Well, let's go back to the Old Testament. We have a story of a beast. Only this beast has a name, and his name is Goliath. And David specifically says of Goliath, this uncircumcised Philistine, he said, I, he says to Saul, he said, I killed a lion and a bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as them. And I'm like, Goliath is playing the part of the Antichrist. David is playing the part of Jesus Christ. And who wins? Jesus Christ. How does he win? A wound in his head, which is what you see in Revelation 13. There's a wound in the beast's head. And David inflicted a deadly wound in Goliath, a beast's head. And he fell face down in front of David, okay? Because everybody's going to fall face down before Jesus Christ. And I, I'm looking at this story now. And, and by the way, Goliath, is, he's got sixes. He's six cubits tall and a span. I think his spearhead or something like that weighed 600 shekels. His brother, we know his brother had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. I mean, you're getting, you're getting a, a, a picture here, a prophetic picture of something that's going to happen in the last days. And then you look at other things that are symbols in the Bible, like a lamb or a stone or a temple. 
or a house or a, even a, a piece of furniture, uh, wine. Uh, the Passover is all 100% symbolic of what Christ did at Calvary. We know this now because of the revelation given to us by way of the New Testament. And when it comes to the study of numbers, that's how I see them in the scriptures. They are there as, as um, placeholders or they're there as symbols to reveal things to us, to open our eyes to things. I, I'll give you an illustration. We know that in Revelation 4, we have the mention of the seven spirits of God. And those seven spirits of God are represented by the seven candlesticks that we see in Revelation 4. This is John getting to see the temple of God in heaven. And he sees the menorah up there, the, the seven candlesticks, which are the seven spirits of God. If you go to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, all seven of those spirits are listed there. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel. I can't remember all of them. But all seven of those spirits are there. And then you go back to the temple or the tabernacle that Moses built. And Moses built this, this candlestick. And it was the only light allowed in, in that whole tabernacle. And it was, you know, lit by uh, olive oil and it, it was seven candlesticks. And those, we know that those candlesticks represented the Holy Spirit. We also know that on the other side of the, of the tabernacle was the table of showbread. Well, we know what that, I mentioned furniture a while ago. We know what that table was. It was a representation of Jesus Christ. It had 12 loaves of fresh Baked, hot, out of the oven, bread. Mm, delicious. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Okay? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And then we have, behind that curtain, the Ark of the Covenant, which we know is the throne of God. It is God's mercy seat. It is where God sits and reigns and rules over his people. So you have the Godhead right there in symbolic form. When you read both testaments of the Bible, then you, you get the understanding of what those symbols mean. When you read the Bible and study the numbers, you don't need me or anybody else for that matter telling you what these numbers mean. You have the book right here. I didn't... I, okay, I have two books... And they are offered to you. I'm going to offer them on every one of these videos uh, to you. The first one that I wrote on Bible numbers was called By Divine Order. And I named it that because of the first verse we're going to look at here. Let's go to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. That's an interesting number, isn't it? We know Jesus was 33 by way of counting the Passovers and the feasts and so on, uh, when he died. So he was 33 and a half, but he was 33 years old. Okay? Right here in 1 Corinthians 14, 33. And here's what you're going to say, some of you. You're going to say, well, uh, the uh, numbering of the verses wasn't in the original manuscripts. If it's not in the original manuscripts, then I, I won't believe it. Okay, that's fine. What I'm showing you is a fact. What you do with those facts is your business. Okay? But I'm going to show you something that God tapped me on the shoulder just before I started talking on this video. Okay? In, in, in about two minutes. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Now, what does an author do? Now, there's several definitions of the word author. Uh, an author originates something, okay? So, whether it, we use it in a literary sense, as in an author writes a book, in this case, either definition of the word author works because Christ is the author of the Bible, 
and the Bible originated in Jesus Christ, who is the embodiment of the Word of God. So, to me, it's interesting that in verse 33, we have a description of both Jesus Christ and his word, which he authored. He authorized it as well. God is not the author of confusion. And so that's a statement that has, uh, I'm not sure what the name of this is, but that statement has an obvious conclusion that doesn't even have to be said. If God is not the author of confusion, then God is the author of order. And I believe that the Bible is given to us by divine order. And in by divine order, I, sh I show you when, when I first started studying the numbers and the number patterns that existed in one English Bible alone, the King James. That's why I call it the King James Code. I don't call it the NIV Code. But anyway, um, I show you those number patterns that God just was just pouring them into me faster than I could write them, okay? And then uh, a while later, I went back and I studied those numbers further and deeper. And I wrote the second book that we offer called the King James Code. Now, as with anything from our ministry, we do not sell merchandise. We do not sell materials. We do not sell our DVDs. We do not sell our books. Now, a DVD costs us about 50 cents to make, okay? So they're relatively cheap, and it doesn't hurt us to send you, you know, some DVDs in the mail. Books cost more. We, we have to, we've got these high volume printers, and we've got this big book binder, and we've got the cutting machines, and it, it, there's labor involved in it, and so on. I mean, we can, we can pop out 11 DVDs in about 10 minutes. Uh, but it takes a, a while longer to make books. We make all of our own books at our church. We have all the materials there, and we do it. And so uh, it would be great if I would say, yeah, these books free of charge. You, you don't have to pay nothing. We don't, in fact, we won't even take your money for it. But we don't have that kind of funds, okay? So if you want both of these books, you can have them. Please consider a, a donation. Uh, and we won't even tell you how much, okay? You just consider a donation of any amount, and we'll send you the books. It's, it's getting Christmas time, okay? You might know somebody that might benefit from these. They might enjoy reading them, okay? All right, anyway, back to this. God is not the author of confusion. That's in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, as we said. And... 33, we'll see it as we move along. 33 is a number for wisdom. Okay? And I have reasons why I, I say that. And of course, it is related to Jesus Christ. Uh, but it's also related to his antithesis. Or his an antichristus, or whatever. It's related to the Antichrist. The phrase, the beast is mentioned 33 times in the New Testament of the King James Bible. Okay? Uh, it's pretty interesting. Now, if I go forward one chapter in 1 Corinthians, from 1 Corinthians 14, where God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints, and I go to 1 Corinthians 15, and I look in the same number verse, 33. You think we'll find something there related to wisdom. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You see it? So in 1 Corinthians 14.33, God is telling us that he doesn't author confusion. He doesn't author chaos. He doesn't, he doesn't author a book that contradicts itself. He doesn't. He does not 
deliberately try to confuse people. In fact, anybody who wants help understanding the Bible, all you got to do is say, God, I need to understand this. And let me give you a verse that says that. It's Jeremiah 33, 3. And it says, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. I, I, I got to throw another one in here. Remember how I mentioned the seven spirits of God were in Isaiah chapter 11? Okay. And you're going, okay, 11, that's confusion. Hang on a second. When I look in Isaiah chapter 11, in my King James Bible, and I see there the listing of the seven spirits of God. It's verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Seven spirits. That verse... Verse 2, where it lists all the seven spirits of God, it's 33 words exactly. That's a fact. Okay? You, you can count it. You can double check it to see if I'm wrong. But you can't say, oh, he made that up. It's 33 words. You say, well, I look in the other translations and it's not there. That's my point in this. Okay? It's not there. It's here. Thus, it's called the King James Code. All right. Now, back to, back to numbers and, and why, uh, why numbers. Um, and I didn't want to do this originally. Uh, I couldn't remember a time when I was in Bible college that uh, somebody was studying numbers in the Bible and they were telling me about it. And I'm like, boy, that, boy I'm, I'm going to stay away from that. that. That sounds like, you know occult numerology and I, I just I did I didn't want I didn't want to look at it and so I prayed about it I felt like God was leading me to study the numbers and um, I don't know how I ended up with them but I had two books one uh, written by E.W. Bullinger back about a hundred years ago and it was on Bible Bible math Bible numbers uh, and he had a list and I'll give you a list here in a little bit had a list of the numbers and what they meant. And then there was another book that I had. Probably somebody loaned it to me and I just didn't give it back. But it was written by an uh, independent Baptist uh, evangelist, uh, Brother Ed Velo. And I didn't know it at the time I was reading his book that he had already passed on. Uh, but he was a generation before me who didn't have computer software that searched the scriptures. What he did is, I tell you, more amazing. He did it the hard way. He got a Strong's Concordance out and counted, you know, words and, and things like that that way. Uh, but he, he had a book on Bible numbers. And, um, and he, of course, gave a list of what he thought the numbers meant. And so I read both of those books, and, and I said, okay, God, um, now that's what they say. And I'm, I wouldn't call them a liar. And, and if, I, if I differentiate from a meaning that they said a certain number means, uh, I'm not trying to be argumentative with them. And I'm not trying to say they're wrong. They got it all wrong. I got it right. I'm just saying maybe I'm standing on the shoulders of giants in, the, in this case. Maybe, I, maybe I'm, you know, have... We add to our collective knowledge over time. That's how people learn stuff, okay? So anyway, um, so I started looking at the numbers in the Bible, and I said, God, I want you to show me what they mean from the Word of God. Let God be true, every man a liar. And so I, I have prayed numerous times, God, I don't want to deliberately lie to people and mislead them. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that I say is true. It's obviously not, because I'm a man. And there is nobody, no man, woman on this earth is ever going to be right all the time in spite of some preacher's egos. They're always going to be wrong about something because God doesn't share his glory with anybody. God is going to be right 
100% of the time. So, so I started studying the numbers. Now, what, what is the difference in studying numbers from the Bible versus occult numerology? Well, it's very simple. Studying the numbers in the Bible is like studying, doing a, doing a study of the lamb um, that was used at the Passover, the lamb that would have been brought to the uh, tabernacle or to the temple according to the book of Leviticus. Uh, it would be like studying the lamb and how it was represented in the Old Testament to understand some doctrine of concerning Christ in the New Testament. We know that John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. We know that when John saw Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, that Jesus, his hair was white like wool, white as snow. Okay? He's a lamb. All right? And he's the Lamb of God. So you study uh, Old Testament symbols. Uh, like a lamb or a table uh, or uh, wine, okay? There's, there, is, there is new wine, the good wine, and then there is uh, Deuteronomy 32, the vine of Sodom. And its wine is bitter. It's, it's wormwood, it's gall. And its wine is poisonous. It's the poison of serpents. That's what Deuteronomy 32 says. So there's two types of wine. You can study wine in the, in the Old Testament and understand wine throughout the Bible. And, and it'll, it'll also help you understand what Jesus made at the wedding feast in Cana. And if you think that Jesus made something that got everybody busted up drunk, keep studying. Okay? That's all I'll say. So anyway... Numbers are symbolic. They represent something. I mentioned the seven spirits of God. So the number seven is one of the most obvious numbers in the Bible. When I go and ask anybody, tell me a number that you think is important in the Bible. Seven is what I'll get from anybody. Okay, And that's because it's used significantly uh, in, the, in the creation. The creation took a week. It took six days, and God took the Sabbath day off. And in Genesis chapter 2, he mentions the Sabbath day. Sabbath means seven in Hebrew. And um, God says that he finished the work. So that tells us what the number seven means, that he sanctified that day. He hallowed that day. So we know that the number seven represents uh, sanctification, being made holy, being made pure, okay, uh, and so on. So we get our meaning of the number seven directly from the text of the scripture. So that when we, when we have a list of, like I just showed you, the seven spirits of God, you know that that coincides then with what the number seven represents. If the number seven represented whoredoms, then obviously there wouldn't be seven spirits of God, would there? Okay. So as I'm studying... The Bible, like in um, the, the book of Daniel, there's a list of things in the book of Daniel that um, are seven things exactly. And when you understand the meaning of the number seven, or you might look at this place here in the scriptures and get your understanding of the number seven from this place. It's Daniel chapter nine. And here we have... Uh, God's going to do something with Israel. And in verse 24, he says it's going to be 70 weeks. Well, that's a multiple of seven, seven times 10. And we know 70 is a significant number. Did you know that the Ten Commandments, first time they're listed in the Bible, is in the 70th chapter of the Bible? Genesis has 50 chapters. The Ten Commandments are in Exodus 20, 70th chapter of the Bible. That's where the Ten Commandments are. The first written word of God. Okay? That's a fact. You can do what you want with it. But it matches 
this idea of what the number seven means. Here he's got 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. And now we're going to count what God's going to do with these 70 weeks. Number one, to finish the transgression. Two, to make an end of, of sins. Three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. And five, to seal up the vision and prophecy, number six, and to anoint the most holy. So these 70 weeks are determined and God's going to do seven things for Israel. And they revolve around sanctifying Israel, forgiving Israel of all of their sins. Now think about that. And somebody asked Jesus one day, just out of the blue, Lord, if my brother sin against me, Shall I forgive him seven times? What did Jesus say? How about 70 times seven times you forgive him? See, the number seven then, we, we have this idea of forgiveness of sins. Okay? Surely when Jesus said, it is finished, he meant exactly, it is finished. Okay, so that's... That's studying the numbers in the Bible. They are symbolic in their meaning. Occult numerology takes numbers, ascribes a meaning to them, and then you use that meaning to try to predict the future or as some sort of sign from God or from the gods, which we know they are familiar spirits, unclean spirits, devils, gods. We, we, we know who that is. Seducing spirits with doctrines of devils. And so people who use numbers for divination are using them to, uh, to try to say this is what's going to happen. Because I looked at my watch three days in a row at exactly 3.33 in the afternoon, I wake up three days in a row at exactly 3.33 a.m. And, and I looked up on, uh, you know, uh, secret teachings or crystal links or some New Age website. And I found that the number three, uh, I don't know, repre represents... Uh, like a, a resurrection that I'm going to have. So I know I'm going to get this new life uh, in, in three days. And see, that's divination. God never said anything like that. But you're using numbers. And you're trying to, di to divine. And, you're, you, and spirits are helping you with this. Spirits are giving you ideas. And they're lying through their teeth. But you're trying to divine the future just like an astrologer would look at, okay, the moon's here and Venus is there. And that means you are going to get married to Bill. Okay? In other words, the stars are telling them what to do. And in this case, the spirits are telling people what to do by the, by the use of numbers. Okay? That's what divination is. And God said, you don't use divination. That's, there's nine things in Deuteronomy 18. Nine is a number for uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Okay, there's nine fruits of the Spirit. And they're listed in the ninth book of the New Testament. Galatians. Amazing. So anyway, that's a fact. Um nine fruits of the spirit and its opposite are nine forbidden practices and divination is one of them. All right. Uh, let me get back to this author word because it's mentioned three times in the King James Bible, the word author. We've already read the first place. God is not the author of confusion. The second place here, Hebrews 5, 9, and it says, and being made perfect, Concerning Christ, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Look at that. So, number one, the first place we find God is not the author of confusion, meaning God is the author of order. 
and his Bible is in order. Just like, just like the stars in the sky, just like the, the, the motions of the moon and the sun, just like, just like God telling ex every tribe exactly where they're supposed to be in the line as God is leading them through the wilderness. Judah's always first and poor Dan's always last. But God put them in those places because he's a God of order. All right. So here now we have God is not the author of confusion. And but God is the author of our eternal salvation. What does that tell you? That God wrote the book that saves man's soul. God wrote that book. There is no other book that can save a man's soul, no other book that can give man eternal life, no other book that can raise man literally from the dead and bring him back to life. There is no other book than the word of God. And God authored a book that gives us eternal salvation. That's the second place. Here's the third one. Oh, look at this one. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, you look at, just look at it. Here's how I'm going to help you with this. Um, anytime you see a list of something, take a look at that list. And let me give you an example. We have the word author three times here. The Bible says that in three, we would say, okay, that would represent the Godhead, the Father, the Son, or the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now, we know the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but that's what theologians use to describe it. So, but anyway, by the way, the word Godhead, three times in this Bible, okay? But anyway, so we know that Christ is the representation of the entire Godhead because the Bible says, for in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when the Bible is speaking of Christ as the author of, of, of this book, it mentions that three different times. He's the author of order. He is the author of eternal salvation. And here in Hebrews 12, 2, he is the author of our faith, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now take that verse and think about it. What uh, the apostle Paul said, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It matches. So if we want to be saved and have eternal salvation and have our house in order when we die, then we must have faith. And the only place to get that faith is by hearing the word of God. Faith, that's three things. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If we go back to this verse, Hebrews 12, 2, not only are we looking at the third occurrence of the word author, and it's the author of our faith, but there's three things that Christ does here. Number one, who for the joy that was set before him, number one, endured the cross, number two, despising the shame, number three, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So I just think, I think the order like that is, is beautiful. So as you learn these numbers and what they mean, anytime you see a list like that in the Bible, count it, okay? And if you don't understand it, I mean, right away, it's like, why is there five there? Just keep reading. Number one, ask God. He'll, he'll help you along. And then just keep reading. And it, it may be the next day. It may be in the middle of the night one night. It may be five years from now. God will show it to you when he's ready, okay? All right, now, Revelation. Uh, to study numbers, we have to have an order from God. To study um, typology, 
we have an order from God. Typology is like uh, literary foreshadowing. In other words, we have Adam. He represents Jesus Christ. We have the first Adam. Christ is the second Adam or the last Adam. Okay? And Adam needs a wife, and God's going to give him a wife. Jesus, the second Adam, needs a wife. God's going to give him a wife. Okay? So, we, you know, we have things like that in the Bible. And um, we have an order given to us in the Scripture to study typology or foreshadowing or uh, the Apostle Paul used the word allegory when he was talking about uh, uh, Abraham and Hagar and Sarah. Now, the word allegory to some people might indicate that the story is not really true, but it has a really cool, true you know, meaning to it. In the case of the Bible, the story's got to be true. Because if the story's a lie, the doctrine's a lie. Remember what, I can't remember if it was Paul or Peter, said, we have not used cunning, as Peter, we have not used cunningly devised fables. When we made known to you the, 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 the gospel. In other words, we didn't follow the story of uh, Osiris and him being the sun rising from the dead. We didn't tell you stories like that. We told you true stuff. So here Paul is teaching about the difference between those who are under the Mount Sinai covenant and those who are under Jerusalem above covenant, the new covenant. And he's using the, the types of Sarah and Hagar. Hagar's bondage, Sarah's free. The story's true, and Paul used the word which is an allegory, so the story's true, and the doctrine then is true. Jesus said, as Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Now you got preachers running around saying, well, you know, a little bit of exaggeration there, and you know, and the author, uh, that, that's, that's okay, it doesn't affect any doctrine. Yeah, it does. Jesus said, as Jonas was in the whale's belly, and if Jonah was not in a whale's belly for three days and three nights, Jesus just lied when he told what, what he was going to do for three days, be in the heart of the earth. As it was in the days of Noah. So you have preachers all over the place saying, well, you know, we can, we can kind of see evidence for a, a, a really huge localized flood there in the, in the Middle Eastern, you know, in the Mesopotamian area. And, you know, there's evidence there for that but you know what a, a, a flood for the whole world you know people didn't live in the whole world back then so you know more than likely it was just a localized flood you have preachers telling stuff like that all the time but jesus said as it was in the days of noah so shall it be at the coming of the son of man and if the bible's lying to you about the days of noah and the story of noah and the flood and how big it was if the bible's lying to you about that if you can't believe the Bible to tell you the truth about the past, what makes you think the Bible's going to be right in telling you what hasn't even happened yet? Okay? So we have an order from the scriptures telling us to, to study these things. We have uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul said these things are an example to us, and they're written for our admonition and learning. So he's, he's using, and the, the Greek word there is tupos, type os, typology, okay? That's, that's where we get it from. So we have a, uh, an order from Scripture telling us to study typology, it tells us to study the law, to, you know, all of these things, that, uh, these tools that we use to understand what the Scripture is saying. Now we have the same kind of order given to us in the Scriptures to study the numbers. See, that was that was one of the things that, you know, I guess I, I'm thankful that God just made me like stubborn, like if God, if I, I hear these men saying it, if you don't say it, I won't believe it. So I just was stubborn that way. So I said, God, I'll, I'll study numbers if you want me to, but you have, you have to show it to me. Okay, Revelation 13. Verse 18. Look at what it says. Here's wisdom. Now this whole chapter is about the, the, 
the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet. But it ends with this very potent verse. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score, and six. We know a score is 20, so it's easy to do the math. Three times 20 is 60. So 660, or three score, and six is the number. You have some Greek manuscripts that say 616. And so you've got some goofball theologians saying, oh, that's an error. It's not 666. If, if you have people telling you that the number of the beast is not 666, that's why you should believe that the number of the beast is 666, okay? Anyway, so we have, a, we have a, the Bible telling us, look, look here is wisdom. God's going to impart to you some, some wisdom here, and you're, you'd, be, you'd be wise to listen to what God is saying and then do what God is saying. Let him that hath understanding... You know how to count, count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Now, that's interesting. Which is it? A beast is not a man, a man is not a beast. Yet. Well, we're living in the days where we're mingling DNA. Man and beast all tied up together in one nice little DNA package that is an abomination to God. So he says there's something about this where the 666 is a number for the beast and it's the number of a man. And incidentally, on day six, beasts were created. The beast of the field, the beast of the land were created. And then man was created. So some would say, you know, the number six is a number for man. Okay, I, yeah, I can accept that. But it's also with the, and they would say because, you know, man was created on day six, but so were the beasts. So it includes both of them for some reason, okay, that I really don't understand yet. But I believe what I'm being told here. Here's wisdom. Let him that had understanding count the number. And that number is 603 score and six. So one day I decided to find the 666th chapter of the Bible. Now, I didn't have the software that we have now, okay? I had a, literally, I did it by hand. I, in fact, I made a, a, a an Excel spreadsheet, and I put Genesis, 50 chapters, Exodus, uh, 40 chapters, and so the sum there was 90 after Exodus, and I made a, a running list of how many chapters were in, in each book and what sum that was as you moved along. So it was easier to find the 666th chapter of the Bible. Because I thought, I'm going to find the name of the beast because it's in the 666th chapter. I'm sure of it. I, I was. I, mean, I was zealous, all right? And I'm like, I'm going to beat everybody on this and I'm going to figure it out first. And I thought, what was I thinking? Like, I'm going to get a prize for it or you know, whatever. But anyway, well, I didn't find the name of the beast in the 666th chapter of the Bible, which is Ecclesiastes 7. If you look at the King James Spirit Bible Search software and go to the Old Testament and you can click on this little button there and it'll give you all these numbers and you can scroll down to 666, chapter 666 and click it and boom, you're at Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Now, notice, here's what it does say. And I wasn't prepared for this, but when I saw it, I went, that's really cool. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 25, Solomon said, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out, look at there, wisdom. Just like John said in Revelation 13, 18. And the reason of things, and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. Solomon got drunk on more than one occasion, okay? Uh, wouldn't you, if you had 700 wives, 
Uh, so he says, I applied my heart to know things. I want to know, I want to understand wisdom. I want to understand uh, high things and mighty things. I, I love Solomon's wisdom. He's, he's the guy that invented the water cycle. No, it's not a bicycle in the water. It's how the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. The water runs down into the sea. The wind and the sun pick up the water in the form of vapor and brings it up and congeals it into clouds. And the clouds come back over the land and drop down the rain. And the rain goes into the river and the rivers run back into the sea. Solomon figured that out by inspiration of God by the wisdom given to him by God as a gift. He figured that out long before anybody else did. Okay? So, he's seeking out wisdom. And then he says, two verses later, in verse 27, Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one, to find out the account. And again, that's the 666th chapter of the Bible. So, we have rules in the Bible. Out of the mouth of two witnesses, or three, let every word be established. We're going to cover that. Um, we have two witnesses. One of them is in the Old Testament. One of them is in the New Testament. They are both telling us that wisdom and knowledge and understanding comes from counting the numbers. And they're both associated with the exact same number. Revelation 13, 18, 603 score and 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, 666 chapter of the Bible. So there's your order. There is the Bible telling you, study the numbers. Learn the numbers. Learn patterns. You know, my dad, I miss my dad. He was a lot of things that I'm not. My dad could garden. Man, he could grow. He'd grow three gardens at once and run them all. Uh, my dad could could fish. It, if there was one fish in the Mississippi River, dad knew where to go get it. Okay? If uh, Squirrels, he'd kill his limit of squirrels, rabbits, deer season, 730, first on opening day of deer season, my dad's got him a buck, headed to the house. How does he do this? Okay. Um, he just, he, he knew the order of things. My dad knew and he followed the signs. He had the farmer's almanac every year and he did it by the signs. Like in Genesis chapter one on the day, fourth day of creation, God said, let the stars and the sun and everything be for signs, seasons, days, and years. And my dad planted by the signs. He fished by the signs. He'd call me and say, the crop here are going to be spawning, Mike. Let's go down and get them. He knew what day they were going to be doing that. He followed the order that God set this world into. And he had great understanding of plants and how they grow and what works and what doesn't work. And, I mean, he was just a, a, a wealth of knowledge. And that's all gone now. I'm missing Okay, I, I only have like this much of what he had. But my heavenly father has given me understanding, I think, and knowledge and a little bit of wisdom in understanding these numbers and, and how they work. And it's just a, a joy to share it with you. So let me do this. I will uh, give you my overall list of what the numbers mean. We, we've had people call and say, does Pastor Mike have a, like a list of what the numbers mean? We had a guy, Brother Wayne, he passed away with COVID. Uh, years ago, he made bookmarks and he put, I read it out of my book and he put the numbers and the meanings on these bookmarks and he, we gave them out and stuff like that. Maybe we could do that again. Uh, or you can get the, the copy of By Divine Order and the King James Code. They'll both have that in there. Or just w watch on the screen. Because I'm going to run down these numbers for you. And uh, we'll call it a day now. And then the next time we get together, we'll, we'll hit this number 
that we're going to go in order. We're going to hit the number one, okay? Now, I don't understand some numbers, okay? Uh, people call me with various numbers that they think is relevant, and they see things there, and I'm, I'm tickled to death that they do that. I, I may not catch it. I may not quite understand it the way they do, but I wouldn't say that they're wrong about it. And so I have a little piece. This guy over here has a little piece. This guy over here has a piece. And so all of us together make the body of Christ, all right? All right, here we go. Number one. The number one <laughs> means, obviously, beginnings, unity, preeminence. Genesis chapters, they're spot on with the number meanings. That was something that I wrote in the book by Divine Order. I just went, that I felt like the Lord was telling me that. Well, you're supposed to test those spirits, right? Test the spirits, see the way they be of God. And I felt like God was saying, Mike, the number meanings in the Genesis chapter. Uh, I'm going to prove this one and see if it's right or wrong. Bingo. Well, I don't play bingo, but sure enough, there was. And this is easy. Genesis 1, the, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness. And I could quote all that to you. But in Genesis 1, we have the, the beginning of everything. We have everything that God created not only did he do it all in this one week, but he did it all in this one chapter, okay? In Genesis chapter one. So we have beginnings. The idea of unity, okay? Um, you have um, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. These three are one. By the way, the King James Bible is the only modern translation that has 1 John 5, 7 in it. 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. If you're not using a King James, you do not have that verse in your Bible. And I would, I would almost offer a $1,000 reward to anybody who could prove to me beyond any doubt or any reasonable doubt the unity of the Godhead without 1 John 5, 7. Uh, there, there is no other verse that says it as plainly as 1 John 5, 7. You take that verse out, you've lost the, the support and the foundation of the teaching of the Godhead. Okay? It's gone. You can't, you can't prove it. Anyway, let's move on. So we have unity. Um, Adam and Eve, okay? They were separate, and yet they too became one. They became the number one, okay? Um, we all are one body in Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all, okay? So that's in the Bible. So we have unity there. Then we have preeminence, and by that I mean God always comes first, period. End of discussion. God does not sit in the co-pilot seat of your life. God does not ride shotgun. God does not sit in the back of the car and and you drive wherever you want to go or wherever you want to take him. God is always first in everything. The sacrifice had to be a firstborn lamb of the first year. Couldn't be older than a year old. And it had to be the firstborn. It had to be one that, that broke the uh, matrix of the, the womb of a of a a female lamb or whatever. Uh, Christ is the firstborn. Okay? He had to be the firstborn. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You're fretting over an endless number of things. If you will just seek first God's kingdom, God takes care of everything else. Okay? I love that. that and I just and I love the meaning of that. And 
we're going to focus on that as our, as our first number that we study. Uh, number two, the number two is for division, union, now it's similar to unity, uh, witness, and I have in here the Gentiles, and I'll say it like the Gentile bride of Jesus Christ. The number two represents that, okay? It represents uh, a period of time as well, okay? And we'll, we'll study all that out as we go along, but like the number two for division, okay? God, uh, on, on when God created light, God saw the light was good and God divided the light from the darkness. Now we got two things. We have light and we have darkness. Darkness is not light and light is not darkness. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So the number two represents things that have been divided. Okay, on day two of creation, God took the waters that were above and the waters below and he put a firmament between them and he divided the waters up here from the waters down here. Okay, uh, the idea of, of union, uh, the two became one. Okay, um, this Bible is Old Testament and New Testament, but they are together unified to give us the complete word of God, all right? Um, the idea of witness, out of the mouth of two witnesses, let every word be established. We have, we have the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. We have the Bible, the two witnesses of the Bible, Old and New Testament. Christ's first coming, Christ's second coming uh, is, you know, related to us. He is the word of God, and so he is the faithful witness who comes the first time, and he's coming the second time. God speaketh once, yea, twice. That's uh, in the, what the Bible says. And when God speaketh once, yea, twice, we have God speaketh once, that's Christ coming the first time. God speaketh twice, Christ coming the second time. God speaketh once, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the two tables in his hand. He's mad, he throws them down, he breaks them. He goes back up, Sinai again gets the, the Ten Commandments written on tables of stone comes down the second time okay to be the the witness he's acting out the first and second coming of jesus christ then three we have obviously the godhead the father the son the holy ghost uh in in uh, genesis chapter one you know paul said in romans one that the godhead could be seen in the creation okay even his eternal power and godhead and you look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, you have the, you have the Godhead there. You have, you have three things there. In the beginning, time, God created the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. And everything in this creation is time and space and matter. And you cannot have matter without space to put it in and time to rule over it. And it's right there in the first verse of the Bible, okay? So it's the number four, his Godhead. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, all right? Uh, but then resurrection. Uh, Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. Um, at, after two days, uh, the Lord will revive us. On the third day, he shall raise us up and we shall live again in his sight. Jesus was... After he crucified, he's, he's, he mentioned it, I t talked about it earlier, that the idea of Jonas being in the whale's belly three days, three nights, Jesus in the heart of the earth three days, three nights, he then is resurrected. So the number three represents resurrection. It also represents sin. When we look in the third chapter of the Bible, Genesis 3, what do we see there? Right at the beginning, we see sin. We see the devil tempting Eve, and Eve looks at the tree, looks at the fruit on it, and she, number one, sees that it looks good. She sees that it's going to be good for food, and then it's desire to make one wise. Now, that is exactly, in the New Testament, it's listed like this. For all that is in the world, the, the you know, I think, uh, I can't remember anyway, but I think it was John, but he said, love not the world, neither the things in the world. For all the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every sin 
that can be committed falls in one or two or all three of these categories. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, he was tempted first with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. He said, look at all these kingdoms. I'll give them all to you if you bow down to me. And then the pride of life, okay? Jump off of this. The angels will come pick you up and so on. And, and where Eve failed those three temptations, Jesus passed those three temptations, okay? How many crosses were there on Golgotha? And the Bible specifically says he was numbered with transgressors, okay? So we'll look, we'll look at that and we'll get more detail in it. Uh, the number four, uh, I, Brother Ed Velo said it represents the world. Um, okay, yeah. Um, let, me, let me go a little bit deeper than that. Okay, I have in here the spiritual realm. We know that we wrestle with principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So I think the number four points to the spiritual realm. Uh, Jerusalem above. New Jerusalem is a city built how? For square. Okay, it's above us, all right? Uh, and again, I'm going to go into detail with this to show you why I believe what I believe about this. Um, obviously represents the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How many, how many, remember the man that was sick of palsy and Jesus was in a house teaching and preaching and people were standing at the door trying to look in, you know, and they, these guys, they, they got his friend, you know, he's, he's got palsy, and he's probably going to die. And how many men took him to Jesus? Four. How many women gave birth to the 12 tribes of Israel? Uh, Rachel, Leah, Billa, and Zilpah, I believe is her name. How many men saved all who would be saved when there was a flood that covered the entire earth. How many men built the ark? Four. Noah and his three sons. Okay? So, I think it represents the gospel. And, it, and Show me four things. I'll show you either the false gospel, the spiritual realm, and how it works, or the real gospel, all right? Uh, the number five, and this is, this is where somebody, somebody, how dare they read my book and call me and contradict me? You know what somebody did? Somebody was doing their own study of Bible numbers. And I loved it. I loved what this guy said. I don't remember who it was. But I, in the book, By Divine Order, I said it, number five represents the rapture. There. And a guy called and he said, I'm not trying to argue with you. He said, I think, it, I think the number five starts out representing death. And I'm like, ah, he's wrong. So I, so I listened to him for a little while and I'm going, okay. And then I started studying it and, and went back and looked at it. The Holy Ghost had this man call me. Okay, and see, I, I don't have all the answers. That's why I want you to study, and you, you seek out what God has for you. But I found out he was right. The number five represents death, and I explain that in detail, okay, in this number five. And I, this is one of my favorite numbers, because then it does represent the rapture, because the rapture beats death, okay? So, now I'll give you an example. Remember, I told you about a list. Um, so in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and reign shall be caught up together with him in the clouds, meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, fight like dogs over these verses. Is that what the Bible says? No, it says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 
So I, I won't argue with anybody over the timing of the rapture. I won't do it. Okay? I would just rather comfort you with the Word of God. All right? Uh, the number six, oh, man, yes, beast, that's there. And I have the, as the number for preparation. Now you're going, oh, where did you get that from? When did Noah build the ark? What chapter? Genesis 6. How old was he when the flood started? 600. Not bad. How much older was John the Baptist than Jesus Christ? Six months. And what did John the Baptist do? Prepare the way of the Lord. It's the number for preparation. Okay? Uh, and I'll, I'll, you know, again, I'll show you all these verses. Uh, but then, I have here man slash God, capital letters, man slash God, little letters. Because... We have in uh, Matthew, um, Matthew chapter 1, we have the genealogy of Jesus. No, it doesn't mean he's a genie. We have the genealogy of Christ, and it's broken down. There's 14 here, 14 here, and 14 here. And so uh, the total number is 42. Well, that's 6 times 7. And so we see that Christ, and we always say the doctrine is, the true doctrine of Christ is that he's fully God and fully man, all right? There's no differentiation between what part of him was man and what part of him was God. And I've heard some preachers come up with some dumb things. I don't want to even get into it. But anyway, he was fully God and fully man at the same time, and he's the only one who can pull this off, okay? Okay. Um, and in, I think it's, uh, first Timothy three sixteen. um, yeah, first Timothy three sixteen. great is the mystery of godliness. Um, and, and I'll count these for you very quickly without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world and received up into glory. Six things. And it's the idea that God became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, okay? So, with that in mind, we go to Genesis 6. What do we see in Genesis 6? We see a very abominable... Um, what's the word I want to use? A very abominable um, mockery of Jesus Christ in the form of the giants. Christ was fully God and fully man. But in Genesis 6, you have the sons of God, which are angels, and the daughters of men, which were human beings, flesh, and they married them, and children came from them. The same became mighty men of old, men of renown. They were the giants, and it happened before the flood, it happened after the flood, and I believe, according to Daniel chapter 2, that the secret of all secrets is they're going to do it again. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That fourth kingdom. Remember the, the, what the number four means? So anyway, that's why I have man, God, capitalized, man, God, little, little letters. Because the devil's version of it is going to be a mixture of devils with human flesh. They will mingle themselves with the seed of men. Uh, the number seven, completion, perfection. Uh, we talked about that earlier, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But everybody pretty much agrees that's the number seven. Uh, the number eight, redemption, new life. Um, I like this one, okay? Um, after the seventh day, what do you have? Do you have the eighth day or do you have the first day? 
both, actually. The eighth day is the first day of the week. Okay? So you have the week goes, and it goes through seven days, and it doesn't just go, okay, the eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 days, 12th day, we don't count it that way. We start all over again back at one. And isn't God as great a God as he is doing something so fantastic for us is that he lets us start over again numerous, in fact, every day. Lamentations tells us that God's, God's mercies are new every day, every morning. We wake up to a whole new day of mercies and starting over. And I blew it yesterday. Well, we're going to, today's a new day. Forget about yesterday. I love that. So we have circumcision, which represents the casting off of this flesh to a new life. What day? Day eight. Okay. And we'll, again, we'll show you that as well. It's beautiful. Okay. And the, then, now we're getting um, high up there. The number nine, fruitfulness, fruit of the spirit. I spoke of that earlier. How does, how many months does a woman carry a child to term? Nine. How old was Sarah when she gave birth to Isaac? 90. You know the phrase Holy Ghost is mentioned exactly 90 times in the King James Bible. That is a fact. And that's something we, that we see this number nine representing the fruit of the Spirit, nine fruits of the Spirit in the ninth book of the New Testament, Galatians. In Genesis chapter 9, <laughs> The first thing out of God's mouth. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful. That's Genesis 9. The only times that phrase, be fruitful, is in the King James Bible. Just take a wild guess. Nine times. Be fruitful, be fruitful, be fruitful. Sarah being 90. And now she's fruitful. She's giving birth. 90. And you know what that represents? Sarah is the old man but she has the new man inside of her. And Isaac, Isaac was the first human to ever be circumcised on the eighth day. First one. Okay, he's a picture of Christ. And it's, isn't that glorious? See, this stuff just, they work together. The numbers... No, the number nine doesn't say, I hate the number eight. We don't get, no, they're all glorious together. Uh, number 10, dominion. 10th chapter of the Bible is where we find the very first king and kingdom. It's Nimrod. And watch this. His kingdom. You know how many cities he ruled over? It's that fourth kingdom. Okay, Babylon. Mm -mm -mm. Um, I mentioned earlier the Ten Commandments. That Romans 7, Paul says, uh, Know ye not that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? So the number 10 is a number for dominion. Ten toes. Okay, if, I'm, if we're playing all, you know, get, kids play... Boys play various games when they're kids. They call it different names. Some of them, I won't, I won't say what some of them are. But anyway, it, it basically involves trying to catch one kid and get him down on the ground, okay? And wrestling him down on the ground. And when you're standing on some kid's chest cavity, you win. You got dominion. You're the king of the hill, okay? Um, and so the number 10 represents dominion. And we'll see that. Uh, in the Bible. Uh, also authority, okay? It represents authority, dominion, who's in charge, the law is in charge, and uh, so there are ten kings, the ten toes, and all of that, we'll look at that. Eleven, confusion. Genesis 11. 
9/11. Yeah. Yeah. And there's and I there's another book that I have called The Babel Conspiracy. And I'm thinking about doing an update of that book uh, with some things that I know now uh, versus what I wrote. Oh, my goodness, this goes back to 2005, 2006, somewhere around in there is when I wrote that. Uh, but anyway, it shows you the, the numerical things that went along with 9-11 and, and kind of what they meant. There's also a, a, a video online that you can find that I did called The Beast of 9-11, okay? You will want to see that, okay? Uh, you can find that on YouTube. You can find it on our sermon audio page, The Beast of 9-11. Uh, if you would like it on DVD, just give us a call. And uh, if we've got copies available, we'll, we'll get them out to you, all right? Uh, but anyway, computer uh, confusion, disorder computers, <laughs> disorder, chaos, that's what the 11 represents. When we have 11 disciples, because Judas hung himself, the 11 disciples aren't sure that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay? They're, they're not sure about it. And there's, it shows you all the confusion that went on along there. Uh, the number 12 represents God's promise. God made a promise to Abram in Genesis 12. He said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. But then... So I've put some thought into this, and I started seeing the number 12 used in ways that I hadn't thought of before, and now it makes more sense to me. It represents the heavens. How many constellations are there? How many months are there in a year? 12. That's because every month we look up and we see a different set of stars than we did last month. The moon goes through that, those 12 cycles in a year, okay? And when God put the Israelites in, in their camp, there were 12 tribes, and they were centered around the tabernacle. And, and Psalm 19 says that the heavens are a tabernacle for the sun. Well, you have the tabernacle here, and you have the 12 tribes representing the 12 constellations, and God, and God said... To Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he said it multiple times, you shall be as the stars of heaven for multitude. Isn't that beautiful? Now think of, think of how that will work now. 12, 12 tribes, Old Testament, 12 apostles, New Testament. And when you look at heavenly Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, what do you see? You see 12 gates representing the 12 tribes. You see 12 foundation stones representing the 12 apostles. It's the heavens, okay? Um, 13, number four, rebellion and wickedness. Oh, listen, Genesis 13, 13. You want to have a little fun when I'm, when I'm done talking? Just go to Genesis 13, 13 and count the number of words that's in Genesis 13, 13. And then look at what the verse is saying and you'll get the meaning of the number 13. Then you can look at like the book of Revelation chapter 17 and you'll see some words just jump out on the, of the page at you because they're all in capital letters. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Thirteen words. Mm. Seventeen. I had to skip some. Transformation. In the 17th chapter of the Bible, God says, you're not going to be Abram anymore. You're going to be Abraham. You're not going to be Sarai anymore. You're going to be Sarah. Adding that, that breath, that spirit sound, that, that fifth letter. They had a transformation, a change. Matthew 17, the 17th chapter of the New Testament. Guess what happens there? You go look at it, all right? 22 is the number for Revelation. How many chapters in the book of Revelation? 22. Revelation's the 66th book of the Bible. I had to think about it for a minute. 22 times 3. Okay? 33, the number for wisdom, spiritual sight. And we saw a little bit of that earlier in 
1 Corinthians 14, 33, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and, and the connection between them. And Christ is the light. He's the light of the world. He's the one that gives us sight. He is where our wisdom comes from, all right? And then we have 66, the word of God. Oh, wait till we get to that. Oh, I love, I love teaching that one, okay? There are some numbers that are my favorites, okay? Like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 17. <laughs> uh, the number five, the number seven is my favorite, one of my favorites. Uh, 33 and 66, uh, they are just right up there with my favorite numbers to talk about because there's just so much in the Bible there. It just blows my mind. I love teaching it and see people going, <gasps> and, and I love that because we have like, it's a helps ministry. I'm not a know-it-all. I'm just, I'm here to help. And if I can get people to fall in love again with their Bible, that's what I'm here for. And then 70 for the king. And no, I don't mean Elvis Presley, okay? Remember, what, remember what's in the 70th chapter of the Bible? Ten Commandments, okay? And there's just a little bit here on the number 70 that I think relates to the king. And we'll see that. All right. Listen, you've I, I've, I've enjoyed today. I love this subject. I it's I, it's been a long time since I've talked about numbers. I don't know why that is, uh, but I was praying and searching for the next Watchman topic, and I've got some some notes started on some potential Watchman broadcasts, but. It just seemed like God has said, Mike, let's, let's go back here and let's do these numbers again. Let's, let's teach them anew like we don't know them. And then, you know, people who haven't learned these and, or didn't know that I talked about these, they can see them for the very first time. Those of us who have gone through this and we've studied them out, we, it's good to refresh them. Okay, that's what Peter said. He's going to stir up our remembrance of these things. And so I hope that you have as much joy in receiving from the Holy Spirit the Word of God as I am having fun delivering to you by way of the Holy Spirit the Word of God and the beauty of the order in it. Remember, I'm only going to give you facts. Okay, now I'll tell you what I think they mean. Logically, I'll make logical conclusions on these facts. But the idea is, if I say this is 70 times in the Bible, it's 70 times in the Bible. You can check me out, but I'm not lying on that, all right? God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. Um, pray for our ministries. Pray for me. Pray for Michael. Pray for us as we minister and labor here in America and go to different places and then minister the word in Kenya and just pray that God will continue to bless as we try to feed the people of Turkana. Please ask God how you can be a part of that. All right. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.